Welcome to My Life Chassid is Supplied, episode 402. This program is dedicated to merit of Baruch bin Yamin ben Menuchelena and Miriam Baschai Sara Altais, and Yukosil ben Leah Rochel and Rochel Bas Liba Farkash, dedicated by Pinchas Todres ben Miriam and Sara Bas Rochel Altais. Today, Pesach Sheni. Pesach Sheni is the second Pesach as mandated in the Torah that when the Jewish people who were unable to bring the offering, the Paschal Lamb, the Korban Pesach on Pesach Rishon, meaning on the 15th of, uh, 14th and 15th of Nisan, when the Jews first left Egypt, so they felt deprived and they came to Moshe Rabbeinu asking, for some way to bring the carbon Pesach. Now, carbon Pesach wasn't just a simple carbon. The truth is no carbon is simple. A carbon is from the word Kiruv, getting closer to God, but especially carbon Pesach was one that, rem- that commemorated and honored the leaving of uh, the Exodus from Egypt and Pesach, which means to transcend Pesach ala, ala, hor, uh, like Pesach ala Horim, which means to transcend and go beyond the regular norm. This was a tremendous um, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And every year it was brought on, on, the, on, the, on Pesach. And here they were deprived. So they came to Moshe Rabbeinu. And ultimately they said, Why are we deprived? And Hashem responded and said, Yes, let them do a Pesach Sheni. So it's an opportunity to fill, fulfill that which they could not do the month before. The Friedrich Rebbe, a classic line that has become very popular and famous, said, we learn from this, nothing is ever lost, nothing is ever too late. We learn that from Pesach Sheni. Because often you think, okay, you had the time to bring the offering and now you can't. So too late. As we see with other mitzvahs, a person doesn't bring an over bottle of carbon. The day passes, you can't bring the carbon tamid, the carbon, the daily carbon that was brought, offering that was brought. You can't bring it day two, the next day, just like you can't put on film for two days. Or you can't keep Shabbos on Sunday or two Shabbos next week if you, God forbid, missed the Shabbos before. Everything is in its time. And that's the way it's structured because Judaism and Torah mitzvahs is structured that you're bringing the divine transcendent energy into time and space. Which that's why this is such a chiddush, such an innovation, that it came to Pesach Sheni, we're beyond that. That you have the capacity, even in time and space, to bring a thing that's beyond time and space and correct something of the past. And even though the day passed and the time passed when the appropriate time to bring the, the Pesach, the Korban Pesach, it's never too late. That's the chiddush. So the lessons to us, the personal mess- lessons to us are quite obvious. Because number one, we all are imperfect human beings and we will make our mistakes. And often once we make a mistake, we think, okay, too late. You can apologize, you can try to amend, make amends, but what has passed has passed. Especially certain pain, certain suffering, certain betrayals and violations that's caused, in our minds, permanent damage to another person or to ourselves, it would seem that there's no way back. And yet Pesach Sheni teaches us that's not the case. Now it's interesting, we don't find this, even though we find the concept of tshuva everywhere. You can always do tshuva, which means to return and repent and repair the past, especially tshuva from love, ma'ava, that has the power to even transform zdenus, nasalei kazachis, that deliberate transgressions, can become merits. Not the transgression itself, but the energy that it generated, especially the love, the deeper love, as the Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya, in cha- the end of chapter 7. And that's why Baal Tshuva has that additional power. So that's overall. But Pesach Sheni is not just Tshuva. It's a, partic- it's a mitzvah. A mitzvah that can come and correct or replace a mitzvah that was meant to be in a particular time. So it's even deeper than just repair of the past. 
you're actually drawing down that mitzvah, even though that mitzvah belongs in the month of, of Nisan. Here you have it in the month of Iyar. On the 14th of Iyar, replacing the 14th of uh, Nisan. But yet the question begs, is it really correct to say? Is it true that it's never too late? Aren't there mistakes that cannot be reversed or corrected? So, this is why we have to dissect it a bit more. To use a physical example, if God forbid somebody got injured, so there are injuries that heal, and the contrary, they even make you stronger. After a while, that part of the body that was injured gets stronger. There are, however, injuries we know, God forbid, a limb is severed, or other injuries that do not get, that you cannot just um, heal from. That, that limb will not grow back. There are things that regenerate and grow back, and some things don't. So based on that, it would seem, in a physical sense, yeah, you can compensate for it, you can find ways around it, you can find uh, strengths in other areas that compensate. Like we see people who, for example, have maybe a weaker hand, so the other hand, becomes, they work with it more, so it's stronger. Or even uh, handicaps, God forbid, where you see someone may be lacking in one particular faculty, but another faculty is a lot stronger. But we're talking about the actual correction that that thing should grow back or that should go back the way it was before the injury. Seemingly in similar situations, that's not the case. How about emotionally and psychologically and spiritually? So we know that there are things we do that God says you're not allowed to do and you do it, even the deliberate sin, and yet we have the power to do tshuva. You're not allowed to sin and say I'm going to then repair that's a problem. Even there, the Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya, im dochak, if a person really pushes, even that they can heal. But why is that not possible? Because you can't use a prosecutor to become a defense, as the expression goes. Ein katega nasa sanega. What does that mean? To use tshuva, which is meant to, or ein sanega nasa katega. To use tshuva, which is meant to forgive or atone for sins, to use that and do a sin with that, in other words, to use the tshuva itself, that doesn't work that way. However, you can do tshuva on that itself and a person can force the door open, even in that case. And to the point that when the tshuva is ma'ava, says the Gemara in Yuma, it's denis nasale, not just kishgogis, it's not just deliberate sins become like inadvertent ones, but they actually become kizachis, nasale kizachis, which means to merits, but nasaloi. No one ever says, God forbid, that the very transgression, the maisa veda, as it's called, the actual transgression, that does not get transformed. That has to be shvidos and zui takanos, and that needs to be eliminated. However, the energy it generated, like I explained earlier, especially in the person, and even the sparks that were there, the divine sparks, the profound divine sparks that were completely trapped in the Shalosh Klippus Atmeis, in the words of the Alter Rebbe. That's why it was Osr, the Kosher Bideach Itzenim. What does Osr mean? Forbidden also means bound, trapped, held hostage in the Bideach Itzenim, in the hands of the enemy, so to speak. But those sparks, when they're redeemed, very powerful sparks that in turn energize the person to even more passionately be committed. So in a certain way, you can say it is the transgression that brought to that and therefore it's transformed. Now, how is that in the context of what we spoke about earlier? But if you hurt another person, we know tshuva doesn't help. Tshuva to God is beautiful. With another person, the other person has been hurt and maybe hurt in an irreversible way. And yet we still say it's never too late. So you have to explain this that there are things that even though you can't correct the injury, but you can correct something and create a deeper connection. You see this sometimes in marriage or in other relationships. There's a betrayal or a violation. Sometimes it, falls, it breaks apart the relationship, correct? But sometimes they dig deeper, the couple, and they find deeper levels of trust. It doesn't mean that they forget what happened or as if it didn't happen. The injury was there. The wound is there but you can reach deeper. 
in a certain way, maybe like the compensation I spoke about earlier. The point being that it's never too late means that no matter what happens, it's not a dead end. It's not over. Which is the key thing to avoid. The despondency, the demoralization, and most importantly, the resignation. That, that's it. Damaged goods, you can't do anything about it. That's not correct. There's always things you can do. You can learn from the experience and become wiser. You can advise others who've gone through that same negative experience because now you have deeper insight. You can dig deeper and reach deep, deeper levels of love and healing that you would never have access without it. And even with another human being, you can find, if you work hard, ways that the connection becomes deeper between the two of you. What happened after the Jews built the Chet Egel? They built the Egel Azov, the golden calf. Moshe Rabbeinu gained forgiveness, Salachti Kidvarecha, and the connection between the Jewish people and God became a deeper one. Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the year. That doesn't mean we forget, we remember very clearly the Torah documents what happened. But what remains from it is that it ultimately led to both God, Kav Yochel, so to speak, and the Jewish people to dig deeper and find a deeper connection. And this time it's indestructible, and that's why in Simchas Teirah we dance in unbridled joy, even more than the dancing and joy of Shavuos. Even though Shavuos, the Torah was given, and Simchas Teirah is just ratified, but Simchas Teirah comes after there was a break, after there was a betrayal. The reconciliation that comes after betrayal is like the Shtar Shiyotzal of Irur. We have a contract that was not challenged. Fine, so the contract is, 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 is uh, valid. If it's appealed or challenged, and then it's upheld, Shtar Shiyotzal of Irur, and then it's upheld, it no longer can be challenged. As long as it wasn't challenged, you can still challenge it and actually maybe re- over- overturn it or disqualify it. But once it's been challenged and upheld, it's like the, the challenge itself has caused it to become stronger. Psychologically, emotionally, this is one of the most important lessons in life because it's basically saying exactly that. It's never too late. How often do people feel, oh, for me, it's too late. I can't really do this. I made too many mistakes, or I'm too weak, or I don't have the willpower. There's a very powerful Reishas Chachma talks about Acher. Acher, Elisha ben Avuya, who was one of the four that went with Rabbi Akiva and the other two, Ben Azim and Ben Zoyma. Ben Zuma. They went up to the Pardis, which meant a spiritual experience. And three of them were, were hurt. One, one died, one went mad. And one became an apostate. And after that, he was called Acher, the other. Rabbi Akiva, Nichnes B'Shalom V'Yatsa B'Shalom. Rabbi Akiva, yeah, the Rabbi Akiva that we'll talk about shortly, connected to this period in time. Students of Rabbi Akiva, and then Rajbi, connected to Lagba Emer. So Rabbi Akiva, Nichnes, he went into peace, went in peace and came out in peace. But Lisha ben Navuya, who was such a great sage and great scholar, and it's so moving to hear the stories of how his student, a mayor, and other students continued to learn from him, even when he had become an apostate. So when he finally passed away, even hell, even Gehenna wouldn't have him. So his soul hovered over his grave until one of his students, of students of students, Rabbi Yehuda, prayed for him, and he was able to enter there. And when he came up to heaven, he was asked, why didn't you do tshuva? You know, ain't l'chadovar emet b'fnei tshuva. Nothing stops. Shuvah can break through any doors. She so said, yeah, because I heard from heaven a voice that said that in actually the expression is that everybody can do Shuvah except Acher. So it was an exception made. And the answer given, Rosh Hashachma says but to him was, you know, however, the halacha, it says, Kol Masha Balabais Emir L'cha Asei Chutz Mitzei that everything the host tells you to do when you're invited to a home, you do except if he tells you to leave. Now this applies also in heaven, because God does all the mitzvahs he tells us to do. So even the Balabai said, chutz, ma'acher, that means that you should not, I'm telling you to leave, you should have still knocked down the door. That's the extent, even in that situation. So it's a tremendous lesson that ultimately the human soul, the divine soul within each one of us, 
has a peace of God, and that is indestructible. So no matter what happens in life, even the worst transgressions, and no one's minimizing them, the damage that they do, and they can do terrible damage, but there's something that's even more powerful, and that's the, the eternity of the divine. And when you can access that, nothing is impossible, and nothing is ever, and no, nothing, it's never too late. Okay. So then the question was asked, if it's truly never too late, why isn't there a Pesach, Shlishi, Revi, etc.? Why isn't there a third Pesach and a fourth Pesach, just like there's a second one? So first of all, there's a concept in Teir and Aloche that once you say there's a second, it really means not that you can actually bring another offering in the next month of Sivan. No, that's not the case. But it means that there is never too late in the spiritual lesson and message that we're discussing. It's never too late, not just that 30 days after Pesach you can correct. It means conceptually any mistake made or any situation that, couldn't allow, that didn't allow you to do what you had to do, whether it's deliberate or not deliberate, like in the case of Pesach Sheni, it's actually or Temeya, the person was impure or was too far from the place where you have to bring the carbon, the, the, the carbon Pesach. But regardless, conceptually, it's never too late. That's the first point. So the concept of Pesach Sheni means forever. However, there's another side to it. There is halacha. We said before that Torah mitzvahs has, comes down at the time and space. Some mitzvahs are not time-bound, especially the six famous mitzvahs like Avas Hashem and Yiras Hashem, loving God, is always learning Torah. Even though it's not counted one of the six, but it's considered that you're supposed to always learn Torah. But there you could also say, there is some connection to time. But there are those that are completely timeless or not time bound. It's called mitzvah she'en azman grama. They're not bound by time. But then their mitzvah is connected to time and very deliberately so because you want to bring the divine timelessness into the structure of time and space. We want to make a dira betachtenim in this lowest of worlds and this world is consists of and comprised of time and space. So the exception of Pesach Sheni is one exception. That even though the time has passed, you're no longer in the 14th of Nisan, but God gave the power, even in time, to go above time and bring it back into time. But still, this doesn't mean completely suspending time and space. So there's a Pesach Sheni that also has a boundary. If someone misses Pesach Sheni, they're going to have to wait till next year. There's no Pesach Shlishi or Revi. Because at the end of the day, we need time. The only thing is that Hashem made an exception here and extended it a month, basically. You can do it in the, second, in the next month, in year, and compensate for what was lacking in the month of Nisan. Okay. Did the Rebbe ever say that Pesach Sheni is an opportune time for Mashiach to come? Well, the Rebbe said every time was opportune time. I'm not in any way minimizing, on the contrary. Wherever the Rebbe had an opportunity to see Mashiach, he saw Mashiach, and which was in everything. And every time, just like Pesach Sheni, yes, exactly, as the person writes out in detail. Because perhaps in the past 2,000 years of Golis, we didn't do everything we could. We could have to bring Mashiach. So Pesach Sheni represents a second chance to do it. So yes, first of all, Pesach B'chlal, we know, Kimet Seischa Mitzrayim Arenen Neflois, that Gula Mashiach through Mashiach is compared to, that just as in the days of taking out, take, when you, the days when you left Egypt, I will show you wonders in the days of Mashiach. So Pesach Sheni is a continuation of Pesach Rish. So the concept is Gula Mashiach. In addition, this point, that's never too late, absolutely adds that point that no matter what we did, we still can correct. And even though we may have been Pnechateinu Galinu Marzenu, due to our sins, we were exiled and misplaced from our natural home in Israel. Through our work, whatever efforts we do, and Jews have already done shuva many times, we, Pesach Sheni teaches us that no matter what happened in the past, the gula can come. I would even add, on a personal note, connected to the Rebbe's words 31 years ago, I did, two thousand was said, Kent, I did everything I can do, do everything you can, and people say, what else can we do? It's 31 years already. Pesach Sheni teaches us it's never too late. Even if you didn't do everything about, and the proof is the gula didn't come yet in the full sense of the word, the redemption, Pesach Sheni teaches us we continue, and therefore it is an absolutely opportune time. 
In addition, I should mention that in Beyuri Azair from the Tzemach Tzedek, which I've cited a few times, he says, his name from the, brings from the name of the Alter Rebbe, in volume 2 in Beyuri Azair, he says that the days of Omer is an opportune time for Mashiach's coming. Okay, when we say the Sefirah Seimer, we talk about the Hirotzen, that ultimately be a Hirotzen and be a Geula of all our, from all our toxins and from all the negative in the Ruach HaTumah Avim in Aretz, when the toxins of this world will be completely removed in the Geula Amitiz Vashlem. Okay. So with that, let us go to another time of the matter, which is actually from yesterday. I began with Pesach Sheni because it's today and tonight. But yesterday, Shabbos, was Yud Gimel Ir. Yud Gimel Ir is the yard site of the Rebbe's brother, Rabbi Yisrael Arya Leib. And actually, it's the 70th yard site because he passed away in Tovshin Yud Beis, and now we're in Tovshin Pei Beis, so 70 years. We know, especially in the later years, the Rebbe spoke about it, especially when Shabbos was on Yud Gimel Ir, spoke about it at length, the name of his brother, all three names, explained it in Avedah. So there's no doubt, especially the 70th, the 70th yard side, the Rebbe would have most likely spoken about it. Maybe he did, wherever the Rebbe is. So I think it's worthwhile just to mention, even though it was yesterday, but it's never too late, so let's talk about that. So 70 in general is a cycle. We see it re- referred to and honored in many different ways, Shivim Shana. When the Rebbe turned 70, his birthday, it's a big thing, Tavshin Lamed Beis, interesting Tavshin Lamed Beis. It's also a Beis, meaning that, that would have been the, the 20th yard site of Rabbi Yisrael Arya Leib. The Rebbe was born in Tavshin Lamed Beis. So the Rebbe, so Shivim Shana has a particular uh, value, particular completion of a cycle, you can say, a completion of an era, if you wish. You know, Pichsidis, it's, it's seven times ten, so it's the seven midas, the cycle of seven days of the week, the seven emotions, that is the full cycle from Chesed through Malchus, times ten, so it's a complete, times ten, times the ten spheres. As far as Rabbi Yisrael Arileib, one of the key messages, actually, is a very Pesach Sheni message. I'm thinking of the Rebbe actually directly connected. I think he did, but I, I can't say 100%. But the message is very clear. Because the name Yisrael Aryeleib, the Rebbe explains that Yisrael is, of course, the name given to Yaakov Avinu. When the Malach, after he prevailed over the, the, the angel, the angel of Esav, in their wrestle, in their fight. So he said, Yisrael, why are you called Yisrael? Because uh, you prevailed over you battled with an angel of God and you prevailed. So Yisrael becomes that prominent name. It's also Li Reish. It's the superior name, so to speak. I would say superior, the higher name that reflects the divine element of Yaakov. Yaakov itself is Yud Ekev, is also the name of Hashem. But as it comes into Eka, Bislaps, it manifests in the heel. And Yisrael is the name, Li Reish, referring to the Reish. On the other hand, Arya Leib is referring to Ishapcha, a lion. And both in the Hebrew word, Arya, and Leib in the Yiddish translation. So it's bringing down godliness into a place that is the opposite of Gdusha and transforming it, the power of Tshuva. So Yisrael and Arileib is like tzaddikim and shuvah. And indeed, the day after the Rebbe stood up from Shiva, the day he stood up from Shiva, in Tovshin Yud Beis, the Rebbe spoke, and then became a Rashimid, which we have, where the Rebbe speaks about that, about Seder Ishtalshus, we've reviewed it as well in previous years, in connection to Yud Gimelir, the idea that the whole Seder Ishtalshus goes in the way of first, from higher place, downward, it spirals down, more concealment, more concealment, with the purpose of it all coming back and being elevated. And that even the descent is part of the elevation. And there are hints to somewhat the life of his brother and the challenges he faced, but that ultimately it's about everything bringing to a higher aliyah, even the yuridim, even the descent. It's a fascinating reshima. With this. It's printed in Lekut Tzichus Chelik Dalet in a footnote in short, and then 
longer, I believe, in Chelek Lamed Kimul, which would be Bamidbar, in the Hesophis and Yud Gimelir, the long Rishima, as the Rebbe wrote, uh, wrote it and edited it. It looks like the Rebbe said it, and then it was written down, and the Rebbe edited it. Later I heard that the Rebbe wrote the whole thing. I'm not sure the details of that. But regardless, it captures the idea that we're saying it's not just we all know we live in a world that's not perfect. And just like Pesach Sheni teaches us that it's never too late, the day of Yud Gimelir, and the Rebbe's brother who went through different ups and downs in his life, as the Rebbe hints to in that Rishima, that even the down is part of the up. So Pesach Sheni teaches us it's never too late. But this is an additional message that even when there's a Yerida that ostensibly looks like it's a concealment, it, the concealment is also part of the revelation. So the lesson continues to each one of us, the relevance, that no matter what you are doing in life, whatever has happened to you, never think that it's, God forbid, the end. Resignation is not acceptable. As long as you have a beating heart and soul within you, a malmamish, there's always hope. There's always movement. And even the setbacks can become part of assets, of a catalyst for tremendous growth. And with this, let us now move to the next timely matter, and that is this Thursday will be Lag Bo'emer. Lag Bo'emer, which is, of course, as the Rebbe explains in all these talks that he delivers, the two main things that happen on Lag Bo'emer, why we celebrate it. One is the Hilula, Yemi Lula v'sim chosesh rajbi the passing of the Rashbi and also the day of his Simcha. Seemingly, you think Hilula is a passing, is not exactly a day of joy. But the Zayr tells us, in the famous Idra Zuta, Idra Zuta is a section of the Zayr where the Rashbi gathers his students. It's called like the, the small gathering, the small community, so to speak. There's an Idra Rabba and Parsha Nose. That's when the Rashbi had all his 10 students with him. But then three passed away, so now there were seven students. The Rajbi gathered them together and told them that he's, uh, he's going to be, his neshama is going to return to heaven. And this is the expression, Bechat Katiris Katarna, with one bound, I get bound to God, and revealed secrets, as the Zayar says, that were never revealed before. It's very esoteric, but very profound Zayar, and the basis of many, many concepts in Kabbalah and Chassidus. And one of the things Rajbi said is, I want you to celebrate Amai Yehilullah. Hilula actually also has the meaning of chasana. Kibay lula domi. So even though I'm sure there they sat shiva and they cried over the passing of Rajbi, but there was also an element of joy, especially in the following years. And that's why we see of all the tanoim, what happens on like Bayman? Jews from all chugim, from all different um, denominations, so to speak, from different backgrounds. Svardim, Ashkenazim. Come celebrate, especially in Miran, which is the burial place of Rajbi, Yem Shim Chase, lighting bonfires and fabringing and honoring Rajbi in every possible way. This became the custom. There are entire Sfarim that are written about Shvoche, the, the praises of Rajbi, the songs that we sing, all the Simcha Rajbi, and especially with children. The Mitla Rebbe would go out into the field, as it says in Ayyem Yem, and the Rabbeim, the Rebbe established the Lag Bema parade, especially for children. And there are different reasons given. There's a beautiful Sikha from the Rebbe, Lag Bema Tav Shemem Bov, where he explains. It's printed, I believe, is also in volume 33, or maybe 28, I'm forgetting already, where the Rebbe uh, uh, edited Sikha, where he explains the connection to children, because Rajbi, firstly, in his time, even children were a knowledgeable primis atera. Mashiach will come, will be the same. And he brings other examples that Rajbi was involved and his tater was involved also in Tanekh Shal Beis Rabbim of children. It's also a day of Zgula for those that need a blessing for children. Because Rajbi was Pekka that caught us. He opened up wombs, his blessings, his prayers. So like Bema became a special day of, of prayers and blessings. So may I extend that to everyone who needs a blessing for a child, that it should come easily, without aggravation, and Hashem should open up, like He did to Hashem Poka da Sora, and same with Chana, that especially on Lagba Emer, and the Rebbe himself would give many brachas to people who needed that blessing. So may that be fulfilled in a healthy child, healthy children. Bishar Tevu 
So Lag Bahima therefore has that unique power. But what is this personal relevance to us? So the second part of what happened in Lag Bahima, the Rebbe brings in many, in many of his talks, many of, maybe every one of his talks, that in addition to the Hilula and Simcha Rajbi, there's also, it was the day when the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva, the plague that took them, that killed them, due to their Leinogu Kovid Zebazeh, that they did not respect and honor each other, the plague ended. So that was a big simcha. And the, in the themes that the Rebbe speaks about, especially in the parades of the children, this is where he talks about the personal relevance. The personal relevance of Rajbi, Rajbi was actually one of the students that remained and that embodied and personified Avis Yisrael, the opposite of what his colleagues, the 24,000 students did. So the first message of tremendous Avis Yisrael, Agba Emer. And you see it in the way that Rajbi speaks to his students. And even the very fact he gave us a gift, celebrate on my day. Why? Because it's the day of Rajbi, the day of Primia Satera. Primia Satera, when you reveal the Primias, that brings joy. It's like Nichnis Yayin, Yotza Said. You don't need the Yayin here, the wine. But when you reveal the premius, you reveal simcha, joy. So all of us have joy within us. And premius atera, which is like the prim, which is connected to premius anashama, reveals it in a celebration. And when you have avis yisrael, achdus yisrael, and unity, that of course is a great, it's a great joy above. As uh, the Alter Rebbe gives the example by Fabrengen, when people come together, when a father sees that his children are united and, and connected, the Ava, the Chiba, the Ava Bereus, in friendship, in camaraderie, that synergy is Barcheinu Avinu Kolonu Kechad. That when we're Kolonu Kechad, when we're all as one, God blesses us. God forbid, when it's not that way, the greatest pain and aggravation for a parent is when they see their children not cooperating, not getting along, or even quarreling with each other. And the second lesson from, from the 24,000 students is, again, the importance of honoring one another, the importance of showing this Avis Yisrael. Now, there are more lessons as well. The very concept of Primi Satera. Rajbi was modded as, he was the author of the Zaya. Rabbi Abba wrote it down, but Rajbi used his teachings. Primi Satera today, after that, Rizal said, Mitzvah Legal Zesa Chachme, that it's a mitzvah to reveal this wisdom, though it was held only for Yechid Gula individuals, through the generations, and then with the Baal Shem Tov hearing from Mashiach, not just the mitzvah to reveal it, but the Futsa Maynesecha Chutzah, to spread the, these wellsprings, your wellsprings of Chassidus outward, to the point of Chutzah Shein Chutzah Memen, to the most farthest outskirts. So the clear lesson of, of, Raj, of, of uh, Lag Ba'emer is the necessity, not just an option, the necessity to teach every Jew and every person the soul of Teirah, the Nishmosa that I said. And be Yafku Migalusa, Barachimin, Bahai Sifr Deloch. And this Sefer, your Sefer, which is like similar to what the Bashiach said to Bashemtab, my Nasech, when your wellsprings will spread outward, that's when Mashiach will come. Bahai Sifr Deloch, it says. In your, with, your, with your Sefer, the Zaya, the Sefer of the Rashbi, Yafku in Yisrael, Jews will leave, Galusa, not just will leave, but Barachimin, with compassion in a kind way, not in a harsh way. So you see the connection of Primi Satera, the need to learn Primi Satera, and you see how critical it is today to avoid getting into the trap of Mitzvah Sanoshim Lamod, the mechanical or robotic Judaism, that it should be with a heart, a soul, with passion, with a chayis, with vitality. That's what we need to teach ourselves and our children. And that's what Neshma Sarayisa does. Of course, you can learn passion, you can learn Gemara, you can learn a Mishnah, you can learn Halacha, Medrash, with passion. But that's the learning is with passion. To be passionate also personally, personal relevance, is when you understand the soul message in each mitzvah, in each part of the Teda, Nishmasa Dar which also brings to the tremendous Simcha that Neshama brings to the picture. When you have a Guv Belay Neshama, God forbid. So yes, you may technically be doing it, but it's lifeless. It's a body without a soul. A soul gives it the chayz, the vitality, the simcha, the love, the passion, the excitement, the energy, the electricity. So that's yet another lesson. There are more lessons as well in Samach Vov, Sfartem Lechem, 
He talks about, like Bemer calls it, Matan Teira of Primisa Teira. So as a Matan Teira, it's the Matan Teira when the Primisa Teira was given to us. There's footnotes from the Rebbe that talk about, what about Yutas Kislev, sometimes it's called Rosh Hashanah of Chesidus, sometimes it's called Simchas Teira of uh, Primisa Teira. There's different expressions used, but like Bemer, Matan Teira of Primisa Teira. Is there a connection between this day and Mashiach? Well, as I said, yes, absolutely. It says, This Sefer will, will, will bring us and redeem us, the Jewish people, from Golis, because Primus Atera reveals the premius of this world and reveals the premius of the neshama and the premius of godliness, which is the whole point of Geula, when it will be v'niglik v'ed Hashem, v'ro kholboser yachdov, molo oretz deyes Hashem k'mayim le'yam echasim. What is deyes Hashem, the knowledge of God? Most directly, it's kol ha-teter, the whole teter, but specifically premius ha So there's no question there's a connection there. And there are other connections as well, which brings me to the connection of um, another person asks, let me just find it. Is there a connection between the rainbow and by extension a bow and arrow to the heralding of Mashiach's arrival? Would that maybe also make a connection between Mashiach and Lagba Ima, maybe? Because the day is associated with Rajbi, who is credited for revealing Primus Satera by writing the Zaya. Answer is absolutely yes. The Zayat itself says, the Gemara says. Medr says, I should say, that um, Mashiach won't come until there'll be a keshes. There'll be a rainbow in the sky. Now, a rainbow, we know, is the covenant that God made with Noyach and by extension with the entire human race, that he would not bring a marble again. But it's not just sermerah. It's not just avoiding the negative. A keshes, which is, like a, which is a rainbow, covers all the colors, refers to Chassidus Kabbalah explain birurim, the birurim. Because a rainbow comes from when the rain falls and the clouds cause a uh, curvature of the light, so you see the rainbow. Which means it's when there's an interaction between heaven and earth. That in the clouds itself, as Kasti Nasati Ba'on, in the clouds itself, and a cloud can be a dark place, when we refine it and we elevate the sparks, which is what the work after the marble, after the flood was meant to be, that prepares the world for Mashiach and Geula. And this is discussed in a number of places in Chassidus, just to give you one place, since I teach every morning Ayin Bays, so we just learned it actually. In volume three, he talks about it in context of the, the, bow, and a, the, bow, the, the arrows that Yenison talks about in the Haftedah that we always say, Mach So he talks about it, and this is what he's, so I'm referring you to the page the page is page 1305 in volume 3 in Ayin Beis, which is taken from Eir Atele, the Maim of Yemel Yenison, and talks about that after the three days that he tells David to go downward and hide, then he says, then I will come and I will shoot. He says that Vani, Shleishu Sachit Sim Tzida Eira, I will shoot three bows into the air, and from the Arizal, he quotes here, that this is Avedis Sabirurim, and it says in the Zohar, Pasha Noyach, Leitetzapel Eragli de Meshich Ati, the Yischaza Hai Keshes Ba'alma, Miskashta Begavne de Nehirin, V'yesnare La'alma. So you should, do not wait, to, or he says in the, in the, in the Leitetzap, you shouldn't wait for the Meshich's arrival until you see the Keshes. This doesn't mean we shouldn't wait for Meshich all the time. He's just saying that is when the opportune time that Mashiach will come when they will see that, that, bo- that, um, that uh, rainbow. The world, you'll see it in the, the, the colors and will be shining in the whole world. Or the Alma, in the world. And he explains, because the Berurim, that's what it brings. This is from a mimer from the Alta Rebbe. Tachas habir l'matcha So this is quoted there. And as I said, it comes from a mimer of Yenus and Tovkuf Samach Zayin from the Alter Rebbe, and with the Hagos of the Tzamech Tzedek in the Eir Atei Volume 1, fascinating mimer, 
and part of this quote is in Ayin Beis, and connects it with the Kesha. So bow and arrow, yes, a bow and arrow, which is the same shape as a rainbow, and hence the name bow, Keshes, is used, the children play with the bow and arrow, as quoted in different Svarim, and like Behman, when they go out, whether it's a parade or, an, or, a, or, a, or a picnic or an outing, that they play with a bow and arrow because it reminds us of Mashiach's coming, which is connected to Rajbi and Lagba Emir. So there you have the connection of all these different items. As I said in the Sikh of Lagba Emir, Tav Shem Vav, the Rebbe explains it more in detail. Okay, it's based on, I think, in the Sikh in the first years, maybe Tav Shem Yud Aleph, where the Rebbe spoke on Lagba Emir, he discussed this as well. And why children? Because children, the Alma, children will be learning Primus Atera, like when Mashiach comes, as it was in the days of Rajbi, a taste of that. So, so we've covered that. One more question. Are any of its rituals taken from non-Jewish sources? Any rituals? Okay, this is a little irreverent question, but since I take all questions, I will say this. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, are some of the rituals we do on Lag Bema borrowed from I feel uncomfortable even saying this, but he writes, pagan rituals, such as the wicker man ritual in ancient Rome where people would dance around a giant bonfire every year at the beginning of the fifth month. And if so, how is it not considered a Zara if we do it? Okay, well, if anything, they may have borrowed stuff from us. That's usually how it worked. Not the other way around, because um, um, the Torah came before other... Uh, custom, so to speak. Um, so just because some people light a bonfire, it doesn't mean that our bonfires are based on that. So there's Svarim, we say, Dose Baharari Kedish, Rabbi Oshara Margolius gathered all the different customs that we do in Rajbi with all the sources where we get the bonfires from and other things. So Chaz Vashalom to say it's rooted in anything that's pagan. Now, whether everybody follows every custom of Lag Bayim, it's at the end of the day, it's customs, not a mitzvah. But a minig yisol, minig yisol teru. No, not a nado pashta, which means every river goes its way. There are people that have different customs and may not follow that custom. But nowhere does anyone make the claim, that I know of at least, that it's related to something that's pagan. But like anything in life, everything has to be done with primis, with teichen. It's not just about lighting a bonfire. It's not just doing something or taking a bow and arrow. It's understanding the significance of it. And most importantly, taking its personal message to heart and becoming more responsible, a more committed human being, a more committed Jew, committed to God, committed to to each other, in all the spirit of deep, profound, and unconditional love for one another. Okay. Since we're talking about the students of Rabbi Akiva, there have been several questions, follow-up, because we spoke about it in the previous weeks in connection to the Omer, as I mentioned, one of the reasons, main reason, we don't make weddings and, and don't do undo, uh, celebration, unnecessary celebrations and leisure and music in the, the, these days is because, as the Gemara says in Yevomis, that the plague, a plague took 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva because they no go covered Zebazer. And it says in the Gemara, Ben Pesach ve'atzeres, that this Magefa, this plague took place between Pesach and Shavuos. So, a few questions on this topic. So what? Why then do we seize mourning on Lag Ba'emer? And on the other hand, we don't make weddings after Lag Ba'emer. If it says in the Gemara clearly that it was between Pesach and Shavuos, so why is Lag Ba'emer we take a break? And there are many that don't continue to do weddings afterwards. There's other customs, but... So this is discussed by different commentaries and different Sfarim. Some actually say, in halacha as well, that, nusr, that they found a nusach in Gemara that says, ben Pesach v'atzeres, that not atzeres, but essentially the, the week of atzeres, or I think it says the half, chetzi atzata, the half, a half a month before atzeres, which is like Bayimut, two weeks before um, Shavuos, more or less. And therefore that the plague, in other words, ended not on Shavuos, but a few weeks before Shavuos. On Lag Ba'emer. Even those that continue not to celebrate after Lag Ba'emer say that on Lag Ba'emer, because of the Hilula of Rajbi, there was the plague had ended. Now remember, the plague happened, of course, before the Rajbi passed away. 
So let me explain. The Rebbe explains it in different talks. The 24,000 or the, tw- the 12,000, the, tw- the, uh, the, 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 um, the double 12,000 groups, because the Rajbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva separated them into groups of two, 12,000 each, so it added up to 24,000, were the students that unfortunately did not honor each other and passed away. But the Gemara continues and says, and therefore the Elam was Shomim, the Elam was like a wilderness desolate, until the, another five students of Rabbi Akiva, and he rebuilt the world and rebuilt Teda, and one of them was the Rajbi. Now it's pretty clear, and the Rebbe explains this in a number of Sikhs, as I mentioned, that Rajbi was not a new student of Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva. They were also students of Rabbi Akiva before, but they were not involved in not honoring, and now Rabbi Akiva had to rebuild with them. But however you explain it, even if you explain that these are five new students that came afterwards, but it's clear that, the, the, that these students did rebuild. Since Rajbi is connected to Lag Bahimir, though at that time he was still obviously in this world, therefore Lag Bahimir is a day when the Tamidi Rabbi Akiva passed, stopped passing away. Lag Bahimir is like when you say Magalgun Schusl Yem Zakai. It's a special day. So the first thing was that the students stopped passing away. Even if you don't connect it to Rajbi. That itself, it stopped. Now, according to some opinions, it stopped and did not resume. According to some, we'll say that it did resume, but that one day it stopped. And that depends on the different customs and different ways of interpreting it. But especially when you add that Ashbi has a connection to Lag Bamer. Even before Lag Bamer became his Yemi Lula, and Ashbi is the, one of the five students that rebuilt and had Avis Yisrael, so it just makes it, it makes it more, fills it out in even a more rounded way in the significance of Lag Bahimer. And therefore Lag Bahimer represents a day the opposite, the antithesis of what the 24,000 students represented. They represented not honoring one another. And, and Lag Bahimer represents the opposite. And that's why chasinus are made and there's celebration and there's music. The question is afterwards, depending on which girsa, which way you go, is it, what, did it stop then and then Basically, there's no more availus, there's no more grieving for these two students, or did it continue afterwards as well? Okay. The next question regarding this, what lessons do we learn today from the students of Rabbi Akiva? Well, it's basically, uh, as I said before, to learn to respect each other, to learn to understand that even students of Rabbi Akiva in their passion, can become very self-contained uh, to the point that they don't tolerate another person. So it's not just about obviously Yisrael, it's also that even if you're a great scholar and completely committed to God and Yiddishkeit, you have to also remember to love God means to love others. Many people can say, you know, I love God. But we learn from Avram Avinu, if you love God, you turn to guests that are coming your way. When God came to greet and be mevaker chela, to visit Avram, Avram turned away and said, there are nomads wandering in the wilderness. And from that we learn, that welcoming guests is even greater than welcoming God. How did Avram Avinu, however, know that? Because he knew loving God is like, the, he says from the Alta Rebbe, if you love God, you love what God loves. God loves his children. It's like saying to someone, I love you, but I don't love your children. So it goes hand in hand. Rabbi Akiva students had one half, they loved God, they loved his Torah. But they did not have what we call the hiskalalus, the interconnectivity. It's like the energies of, t- of Toyu. They're very powerful energies, Eris Merubim, and they're divine energies. But they have not learned to coexist yet with each other, and they have definitely not learned how to go into the containers and interact and interconnect. In Tikkun, which is what the five students afterwards, including Rajbi, they not just had these energies, but the energies are now in containers and the energies work with each other and don't create chaos, but create, on the contrary, harmony within diversity. That's the lesson. When people disrespect each other today, does it have a negative impact? Someone else wrote it in a more personal way. Why were the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva punished for disrespecting each other? But there was no such similar plague in yeshiva for students who disrespected me by pushing and shoving a shul and tossing my hat 
and other ways of bullying me. So first of all, every time a person disrespects another, there are consequences, unfortunately. Because it's not just tit for tat. It's like the Yerushalmi says, we're all part of one organism. And just like it's inconceivable that the right hand is going to hit the left hand, it should be inconceivable for us to hurt each other. Because when you hurt another, you're hurting yourself. You just don't feel it. But it's all part of one thing. So there's always consequences. Thank God that Hashem protects us and the consequences don't translate in a plague, Rahman al But from the lessons of Rabbi Kiva students, we should learn there are consequences. Because at the end of the day, it wasn't they just died as a punishment. They'd self-destroy. What happens when you can't get along with each other, when you need each other? Think of a human body where the organs begin to fight with each other. Autoimmune diseases, where the body turns on itself, is destructive. So it's cause and effect. And we have to always remember that. And that's why the base Amigdash was destroyed because of Sinas Chinam. What's the connection? Because there's no Barcheinu Avinu, Kolonu Kechad. You want Vishachanti Besechem, God, to rest among you, to dwell among you. You need to be united. The organism has to be interconnected with each other. And when it's not, it's cause and effect. It causes that the Shechina can't be with us in a revealed way. When Mashiach comes and we reverse it, Avas Chinam, unconditional love for each other, that creates the unity. It says, God did not find any other, ble- any other keli that can contain his blessings except Shalom. And the reason is very straight, because Sholem creates a healthy organism that allows for a blessing. And that's also why when we start davening, we say, Mitzvah, What's the connection? The question is asked. What's the connection? We go into daven to Hashem. Because davening is like a carbon. You bring an offering to God. Offering needs that the koyen should be complete. can be a balmum, as we discussed last week. And if you're not connected with other Jews or all part of your organism, you're not complete. You want to daven properly, get closer to God, bring a carbon. You need to connect yourself and unite yourself with everyone around you. As the Tzamech Tzedek beautifully explains in that Maimer, Mitzvah Avis Yisrael, which is worth reading and learning, especially connection to Rabbi Akiva, who said, That's a fundamental, a cardinal rule in the Torah. So, well, this is somewhat of a, I guess, a little uh, tongue-in-cheek, but I'll read it. Did Rabbi Akiva students die of COVID? Most likely not. And perhaps their not respecting each other was exhibited by not getting vaccinated, not washing their hands, not wearing masks, and not social distancing wherever possible. Okay, I don't want to politicize this in getting into this whole discussion um, Obviously, we all understand that whenever there is a, a plague or disease, we have to protect ourselves and others. But we also have to not overdo it. And when it becomes political and it becomes a statement, then also I see people becoming obnoxious around it. That usually is a sign there's something wrong. So if it's purely medical and the doctor says so, is one thing. Um, so I don't want to really politicize this. Rabbi Kiva students is because of lack of respect. And it was not because they did or did not wear masks. It was because they simply did not respect each other. And respect each other also means that you don't need to wear a mask, you don't impose it on others as well. Everyone can do whatever they like. So remember, it goes both ways. Disrespectful means on all possible levels, since you're already bringing it up. Okay. So now we move to, since we're talking about Mashiach, here's a question that came in. How should I react when recently a certain quote-unquote big rabbi gave a shir, a class recently, and how it's wrong to demand Mashiach. Meaning, how it's wrong to say we want Mashiach now. And tries to prove his point with his sources. I know, of course, that that's the right thing to do because the Rebbe said so, but it still doesn't settle with me perfectly. What would be the best way to approach that? An answer will be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Another person writes, or maybe it's the same person, how should I react when I hear prominent rabbis online coming out against the Rebbe's approach on Inyanim, such as Mashiach, Mifzayim, Shlichus, etc. Well, we learn from the Rebbe and take this approach. Anon, Paul, Yemoma, Anon. We are day workers. Our job is not to fight darkness and not to, fight, and not to argue and debate issues. It's to bring light to this world. 
So first of all, when a Rebbe says something, when the Rebbe says something, we have all the plates, the shoulders. We're going on an Eisenhower brick, on an iron, indestructible bridge. A Rebbe, the son of, son-in-law of, in a direct chain, all the way back to the Alter Rebbe, all the way back to the Maral, all the way back to Moshe Rabbeinu. Ish me pi ish. A nosi ador, who knows the Tere, knows the Zaloche, and knows all the things that anyone else may bring. So we have a full authority that says it, and that should be enough. Obviously, the Rebbe wants Nasev and Nishma also to understand. So the Rebbe brings sources. In the mid mems when the Rebbe spoke very strongly about L'shuoscha Kavinu Kol for your salvation, I Kavinu, I wait. I, it's not just waiting passively. Mechake Lebiyose, says the Rambam. Not just we wait and we hope that Mashiach will come or we, uh, we believe that he will come. But it's an act of waiting, even demanding, and the Rebbe brought a chidah, and other sources. Now demanding, we demand in davening also. We ask God to, we beseech God, please, please, in old tefillahs, heal our sick, give us parnosa. So why when it comes to Mashiach, can't we do it, make some sort of demand? Now when a demand, we're not talking about a demand in chutzpah in the wrong way. On the contrary, you're the one, you God created the world. You created for a purpose. Do it for yourself. Why should it be a case that the Saint Yisrael should say, You're the one that promised that Mashiach will come. We have done everything we can do. We'll do, we'll continue doing. So that's the tone. And anyone who heard the Rebbe speak about this and reads the Rebbe Sichas without any agenda and without any uh, political or other uh, motives or preconceived notions, it's very clear. And you see how it's, t- how, it's, how it's awakened so many people in songs, in music, including like Bo'emer, that we are actively remembering and not forgetting that we're in Golis and actively demanding, seeking and demanding that the Geula come. And it's not just about a Geula. This is also critical. I think many people misunderstand. They think the Geula is some type of like retirement village. So how could we demand a retirement? The Geula is the fulfillment of God's purpose in existence. So you're telling God, we want, we demand that your, that your purpose, what you wanted in creating existence should be fulfilled. Anyone who learns Chassidus and understands that, clearly understands, it's like demanding the revelation of godliness in this world. To ignore that and be passive, it's like saying, okay, no problem that God is concealed, no problem that God's promises are not fulfilled. It's a misunderstanding of the whole concept of Mashiach. In the words of the Rambam, if we want pure halacha, without even using words of chassidus, that the, that the completion of doing mitzvahs, to do mitzvahs completely can only be when Mashiach comes and the Beis Amidlish is restored. So we're talking about a completion of serving Hashem. That's what we're talking about here. And I can go on and on. The same thing is with other, the Rebbe was criticized as a leader, for sending shluchim out, for a different, what uh, the Rebbe didn't like, the word kiru, we won't use the word kiru, mifzoyim, and so on. What do you see then? Not only has it brought so many yidin and so many people back to God into Yiddishkeit, you see others replicating it. Now, is there jealousy? Is there misunderstanding? Is there ignorance? There's plenty of it. So we have to be informed to be able to answer. When someone brings it up, you have to determine if it's lekanter, so no matter what you explain to the person, they don't listen because they're just so convinced, then probably best is just to avoid uh, arguing. So it's mitzvah, it says, says dama shetoshiv. you should know what to answer. Doesn't mean you have to always answer. And sometimes, al tan oval In other words, sometimes it's important not to, you have to actually answer because you just may get caught up in an entangled debate that doesn't go anywhere, especially when pride and ego and condescension and judgment is in play. <clears throat> but you have to know what to answer. And everything has a source. Nothing is just comes from nowhere. Lagbema parades were criticized by some. And you go back and understand the Rajbi, Yem Sim Chase, the connection to children. And you come to realize this is all saturated with Gdusha and Teira Mitzvahs. And it adds in Teira Vedi Mils Chasadim, as we see Bepayel. So you have to look at the whole picture here. And the fact that there's distrust or there's previous uh, stereotypes or previous... Uh, previous uh, toxins 
that some people have to Chabad or to the Rebbe. That's their problem, not our problem. But we still have to be spreading light, as I said, we're day workers, and we have to do everything possible to illuminate, to educate, to inspire. And when we do that, especially through chassidus, all through light, and through kindness, and positive ways, and emes me'eretz titzmach, words from the heart enter the heart, and the truth will ultimately prevail. Okay. A few more questions. Let's see how we can cover as much as we can. What can we learn from rising gas prices? Okay, completely different topic. Is the high price of gasoline a secret message from Hashem telling us we should not be driving our car so much? Personally, I have to drive a lot. I live upstate and I'm 20 miles from the nearest shul and I'm the 10th person that depend on, they depend on to make a minion. I did the math. If I go to shul twice a day, once for Shachas and again for Min Chemayev, which they do together, I'm driving 80 miles a day, six days a week, for a total of 480 miles a week. At $4.79 a gallon, it costs me $50 a week, $200 a month, $2,400 a year to go to shul in order to help complete a minion. Can you please, in your capacity as a respected rabbi, give me a bracha that my parnasa increases drastically so I can continue to afford to do this? Thank you. So two questions. We'll address, I'll address the last point first. First of all, I commend you greatly. I actually was starting to think it was a lot more money than that, but listen, money is money. Adam chas amaisi yodav, the Ebrish does chas, every penny counts. Um, however, look at it this way. It's like zaka. You're doing it for a mitzvah. What better way to direct your money? As the Rebbe always says, tzedakah, when you're using it for good things, God will make sure that you don't use it for anything, God forbid, negative. Medicine or healing or stuff like that. So that's number th- one. Number two, of course, I absolutely give you my bracha. I give everybody's brachas on behalf of everyone that listens to this program and benefits from it. That you should have a parnas of many, many times over of the amount you're spending. But I'm, again, it's beautiful that is going for such a cause. Now, if the gas prices go down, I'm sure uh, that's, uh, the savings will also be <laughs> beneficial. As far as the lessons go in rising, uh, rising gas prices, look, the Baal Shem Tov did say everything that we hear and, and see is a lesson in life. And Avedis Hashem. I mean, I can mention some that come up. Whether we should be driving less? Yes, we should be driving less for the wrong reasons. If it's for good reasons, like what you're doing, we drive to do a mitzvah. Have a Ratzel Advar Mitzvah. So maybe there's a lesson in that, that we shouldn't so worship our cars and every time we go somewhere, maybe it's also a lesson to walk a bit more and not always to drive. Um, and there are other lessons as well. Remember the rising gas prices are due to shortages or people taking advantage of the shortages due to the war in Ukraine, other things going on in the world. So there's always some sometimes nefarious and uh, underhanded things going on behind the scenes. So I don't want to overread into it because it's not always coming from God. God is not the one that rolls the, the prices. Maybe God allowed the situation to evolve this way. You know, people and Jews and people in general, and Jews in particular, should deserve to be able to live their lives without having to spend exorbitant amounts on survival like gas or food, other shortages that are happening, food prices that are rising as well. And we should be able to get to a point where we can Madanim would seem offer when Mashiach comes. There'll be delights everywhere, and money won't be that significant in that sense, if at all significant. So maybe come to that time. And meanwhile, gouging, price gouging, and other ways of taking advantage of people is just not humane and not appropriate, even though that's what happens in times like this. So we have to learn from it to become kinder people, wherever possible. If you're in the control, you don't have to also join this, this uh, hulanke, this whole party of raising prices on everyone. I remember the sicha. Tezvov Tammuz Tovshim Hey, the same talk where the Rebbe first talked about the books that were stolen, the Svarim that were stolen. So he also spoke about that, we sh- that in Crown Heights, and this of course is a lesson everywhere, that we should make sure that, that prices don't just go up and let people be able to afford housing, buying or renting, and not to gouge and not to take advantage of people. The Rebbe was very, very sharp in that sicha. So this applies to all times, that even though we may have opportunities here to raise a little more, a little more markup, it's not the trade away. Trade away is chesed. Obviously make parnasa, make your revach, your, your profit. But it shouldn't be in ways that, in any ways, that hurt and take advantage of other people. That's just a general comment. 
And I'm sure there are other lessons. I'd love to hear from you. This is a good opportunity. Go to chassidusapply.com. There we have a forum. You can ask and comment completely anonymously. You also can find all the previous 401 episodes archived. Also the essay and creative contest submissions that are there. Plus other Hasidic resources on Ayin Bays that I teach every morning, which you're welcome to participate in. The details are all there at Samach Vov, uh, programs and classes on Samach Vov, as well as other Hasidic materials. Hasidusapply.com Okay. Now, been a, somewhat of a follow-up. I see there's a lot of follow-up, actually. I will do one or two and leave the others for another time. I'll do one since the month of year. Let's do that. Dear Rabbi, I've been listening to your video since many years now. When you couldn't do your episodes because of your health issue, I thank God that you are fine now. I realized that I was missing your soothing and calming voice. A few years ago, your Torah teachings helped me go through one of the toughest times in my life. You kept me afloat. Without you, I don't know if I would have been able, if I would have been able to overcome that period of time. I learned to be more balanced and put my life on the good track. You're, you help me take hard, make hard, you help me take hard decisions. Sometimes to do what's right is more difficult than to do what's easy. I had to apply effort, discipline, and endurance, but thanks to you, I did it. Thank you for saying that no one is damaged goods. The things that happen to us don't define us. You're a very special man. Thank you for all you do. I'm happy that your followers are growing exponentially. I write to you because I learned that year is the month of time. I was wondering where months come from. Were they created with Adam and Eve? I know the seven days a week was created with the Torah. Best regards. So firstly, thank you for your very kind and warm words. Very touching and very meaningful to me. And um, you should continue to grow. Impact. Pay it forward and influence as many people with great, beautiful light. As far as the question itself, it's not necessarily connected specifically to the month of year, but it's true. The months, actually, the Torah begins with days of the week created by God. As the Zayar says, six days God created. He also created the very days, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, through Shabbos. It's the first the time months come into the picture is actually the story of Pesach. When God speaks to Moshe Rabbeinu in Egypt and tells him, this month, this new moon will be your new moon. You will start counting by the months, the lunar calendar. And the new moon will be the beginning of the month. And the 15th of the month, two weeks from now, will be the full moon. And this month, the people will be leave Egypt. And from here on, we sanctify the moon, the Kiddush HaLavana, that we do every month. The Jews are compared to the moon. And the moon gets renewed, and we get renewed like it, and so on. That's where months come from. But in the Torah, these months are called by number. Nisan being the Chedesh Arishan, the first month. Ir is Chedesh Hasheni, the second month. Sivan is Chedesh Hashlishi, and so on. Until Chedesh Adar, which is the 11th, the 12th month. In a, in a, a leap year, like this year, there are two others. So months begin the Torah and all the details that come with it. The names of the months... It says Shemus, Sha'ole Imam Mibavel, names like Nisan, Ir, Sivan, with a few exceptions, were the names that when the Jews, after the, second, the destruction of the first temple, were exiled to Babylon. So there they gave the names that came like Babylonian names or names that they assumed then. So they gave the months, each of the names that we have, including Tishrei, including the other names. As I said, some of them are actually mentioned in the Tanakh, but mostly, but the numbers are basically biblical. And then there's the names that came from the Babylonian exile. And when they returned to Israel, all of them are in the bubble with those names. Okay. There's some other follow-up, which I'm going to do later because of time limitations. What I'm going to do now is the Chassidus question. Oh, before the Chassidus question, I'll do one more. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, I was pleasantly surprised to hear you talk about butterflies. This was a talk I gave. I'm not, I don't remember if it was Exodus Applied or one of my other programs, maybe Wednesday night class. 
a master class. But regardless, I spoke about the metamorphosis that a butterfly from a caterpillar with different lessons we learn from that. So the person is referring to that. I've been wondering about them for a while. I own a beautiful set of linens that have butterflies on them, as well as two pieces of jewelry with butterflies. Specifically for these two things, is it okay to have the butterflies? I appreciate your time and knowledge. I see no issue with it. Um, Though the Rebbe did say when he spoke about children or in general, possible not to bring images of impure animals. I don't know if it would apply to this. Um, There are many linens that people have, different things embroidered on them. So practically speaking, I don't see an issue with it. If uh, you had a choice to buy, and it could be, uh, I don't know if there's such a thing as kosher butterflies, I don't believe so, because these are insects, starting as caterpillars. If if you're able to have images that are of kosher animals versus uh, non-kosher ones, maybe there'd be a preference. But I would suggest speaking to Mashpia. My personal inclination is I don't think this would be something that we need to go make a big issue of, uh, especially once you have them. You don't have to throw them out or remove the butterflies from it. And may the butterflies serve as a lesson. At the end of the day, they are God's creatures. A lesson of growth, of metamorphosis, of evolution, from being a caterpillar that crawls on the ground to developing wings that soar, which is a good lesson in life in general. And I'll conclude now with the Chassidus question. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, can you give an explanation on the different energies between the holidays that the Torah establishes and the holidays that the rabbis established later over the years? For example, the Torah tells us we must observe Pesach, but the holidays of Hanukkah, Purim, and Lag Baomer were established later due to certain miraculous events. Could it be said that the Torah-sourced holidays have a flow from above to below? Asarusa de la Elo, or Lamailab, because God established them in the holidays, the rabbis established have a flow from below to above, Asarusa de la Tata, because they come from us. Is there an advantage of one over the other? Also, is there a source saying that during Mashiach's time we will only observe the, holiday, the holidays that we established? Thank you. And may you and everyone listening to this broadcast be blessed directly by Hashem from His energy of Teferis. And may the blessings be used to bring positive change and goodness and kindness into the world. So the first question, a very interesting question. We know that, that time is energy, and especially a time that's sanctified, like Shabbos, Mekatsha, Mekayma. Abish is sanctified. And Yontav, even though Mekatsha, Yisrael, Vazmanim, which means it's somewhat dependent on Bezdin, designated when is the new month, which in turn designates the holiday. But it's still a Kedusha that comes from above. And then there are holidays as rabbinic ones like Purim and Hanukkah. I think like Bema would be another category, but also initiated by the rabbis. So the question is asking, which makes a lot of sense, that maybe one is an energy like an Asusa de la Le'ela, and one is Asusa de la Tata. Both of them have divine energy, but one was initiated from below, one from above. I would say it makes sense. I've not seen it, but you could explain it that way. I would add, however, that when something is generated from below, it also in turn generates something from above. So once Purim was established and Hanukkah was established, also from Hashem we get an energy. However, it first initiated from below. Purim especially, Mordechai and Esther asked the Chachamim to designate Purim. When it comes to Lag Bahimer, of course, it's even more initiated below. Rajbi asked that that they be honored. I would also say when it comes, on the other hand, Asus Delela also has an element of Asus Delutata. When it comes to Shabbos, even though the seventh day is always Shabbos, but there's also our participation to the point that when you don't know when is the seventh day, let's say you're walking in the Midbar in a wilderness, it says count six days and the seventh day is Shabbos. That means, even though technically it may not be, but it's up to the human being. When it comes to Yom Tov, Yom Tov is like, yes, Kedusha from above, but it also has much more effort coming from below because Bezdin designates when the Yom Tov will actually be. So at the end of the day, it's a joining and a fusion of both the divine energy flowing, and our effort, and they come together, and we have a special day, an Es Ratzin, special energy, that is, comes from a place higher than time, but comes into each time in the world, and it's time, as the Alter Rebbe explains, in Madura Basin, Shulchan Aruch, Simen Hay. Regarding the second question, so it does say that all the Yom Tevim will be bottle, will be nullified in the future, and explains nullified means due to the great light, not nullified, God forbid, 
in a negative way. They'll be absorbed in a greater. Except Purim, sometimes it speaks about other days. And one of the explanations is because certain days have the power from below, but also an additional message that, that shines and stands out. So it is correct to say that. And there's the question about Pesach. Will Pesach be observed? Some say it will definitely be remembered. Questions will it be observed or lost love, the Gula will be even, will, will not override, but outshine, so to speak, so Pesach will be included. And the Rebbe explains that Pesach will always be observed. The question is, it will be observed then in a far greater way through, um, through the Gula. The question is, will there be special things happening on the 15th of Nisan for the seven, eight days of Pesach? So this is for another time, and we'll discuss it another time. This has been My Life Chassidus Applied. We're here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. Um, please go to chassidusapplied.com. Everyone should have a very fruitful and meaningful Pesach Sheni as we're concluding it, and a very celebratory and simcha dika like Ba'imer. And we should finally merit in this week, even before, like Ba'imer to the Gula, Hamitiz Vashlema. Be well, everyone. Thank you. This program is brought to you by My Life, Chassidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidusapplied.com slash donate.